Okay, so we're going to consider electrostatics, <clears throat> and by electrostatics, I mean the actions of charges that are not moving. It turns out, actually, that when we apply electrostatics to electroosmotic flow, we'll have fluid that's moving, that fluid will have a charge density, and therefore those ions, in fact, are moving. And once we put this solution into an electroosmotic flow, strictly speaking, that is the simplest form of electrodynamics. But the relations that we're interested in, as long as we're not keeping track of how ions move around, keeping track of electrophoretic mobilities of ions, for example, as long as we're not doing that, which we're not doing yet, really this problem is an electrostatic problem. So we're going to consider electrostatics, and in particular, we're going to ignore magnetism. <clears throat> and the primary reason why we're going to ignore magnetism in most of the aspects of this class is that, yes, we can have a microfluidic device and we can put it close to a magnet, and so we will in fact talk about what happens when you do that. But in terms of the motion of ions causing magnetic fields, the fact is that the charge in electrolyte solutions in microfluidic devices is carried by ions moving in water, and ions move in water way, way, way more slowly than electrons do moving along wires. And so if you try to create a magnetic field by having ions zip around in water, you find that you create very, very little magnetic field. So we're going to find that for most of our work, we're just going to ignore magnetism. The only way we'll get magnetic effects in our devices is if we put a magnet next to them. <coughs> and that's a very specific set of applications. Okay, so in the electrostatic limit, if we ignore magnetism, there are really only a couple things that we need to know. First of all, if we have a source charge, Source charges create electric displacements. And I'll write uh, this relation in this form. I have an electric displacement D. I have a charge, Q, and then my notation here, here I'm using delta R to denote a distance in a radial direction. Most people would just write this as R. The reason why I write delta R is because I want to stress that it's a distance between two things that need not necessarily be the origin of a coordinate system. If I only have one charge, I can always just put it at the origin of my coordinate system and my math all works out. But if I have three different charges, that doesn't work anymore. So to denote that, I like, I like to use the notation delta R to denote that. Here I have an R with a circumflex, and the circumflex just denotes that this is a unit vector. And so this is a unit vector. in the radial direction. And in fact, this is the first equation that you would get in an undergraduate electricity and magnetism class, or maybe the second one, who knows. So physically what this tells you is if I have some charge that I put in some location, I can see the effect of that charge in its surroundings in terms of an electric displacement. This electric displacement D is a function of this charge. It's a vector that's aligned radially away from this charge. And it's a function of, it's the, the magnitude of the electric displacement is a function of the distance from that charge associated with this delta R squared term. The second thing is that if I have a charge, which in this context I would call a test charge, <clears throat> these charges are the same sort of charges. I use source charge when I'm talking about how the charge creates a change in its environment. So here I'm saying the existence of a charge creates an electric displacement. I'll use the term test charge 
when I'm talking about how a charge itself is influenced by its environment. And so this just says that if I have a charge in an electric field, it feels a force that's equal to Q times E. Now, this electric displacement D can be thought of as having two different parts. One, this electric displacement is partially described by the electric field. Second, this electric displacement also involves the polarization of the medium. So if I have a charge in free space, it induces an electric field, but there's no medium around it, so there's no polarization, so I would never talk about this. However, I always want to talk about what charges do in water, which means I'm never going to talk about free space. I'm always going to talk about what a charge does when it's in water. And when it charges in water, it d does two things. It creates an electric field, but it also causes a lot of polarization of the medium. In water, I have an oxygen molecule stuck to two, or sorry, an oxygen atom uh, that's covalently bonded to two hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms have a partial positive charge. This oxygen atom has a partial negative charge. So this molecule has an inherent dipole. This dipole is organized randomly with some amount of ordering due to hydrogen bonding and things like that. But at least statistically speaking, its orientation in uh, space is random. If I apply, if I place a charge around this water, it's going to induce an electric field, but it's also going to induce a polarization of this water molecule. So if I put a negative charge somewhere, all the water around it's going to rotate so that, statistically speaking, the, hydrogen, the positive components, the hydrogen atoms, are closer to this negative charge. Now, I said this electric displacement has these two components, both an induced electric field and a relative polarization of the medium. And I can express that algebraically in several different forms. The physics of all these forms all mean the same thing, it's just different notation. Here, I've said that my electric displacement has two parts, an electric field and a polarization. Here, I'm saying that my polarization can be described in terms of a quantity called the electric susceptibility. And then in this last case, I've said that this response can be described in terms of an electrical permittivity. And all of these three descriptions, while they can be shown to be equivalent, really focus on slightly different aspects of the problem. I'll argue that this statement really describes the physics of the problem. I will say that this statement allows us to very clearly delineate the difference between the part of free space that's responding to the system as compared to the, the part of the medium or the water that's responding to it. And this is the one that involves the smallest actual like trajectory of my hand when I write the symbols. There's only one symbol, I don't have to write a plus sign. You know, there, there you go. Now we're going to use this last one 
because of the laziness of your instructor. <clears throat> and because that's what's in the textbook, and now I can't change. But I also think that, that all of these have their own merits. So as I said, the top thing says, OK, one thing we're doing is we're creating an electric field. Also, we're creating a polarization of the medium. If we write it this way, basically we're saying d is equal to e, this e times 1 gives us this e. This is basically saying the, ve the vector polarization is given by this electric susceptibility times the electric field. And this is useful because if I say, OK, well, what's the electric susceptibility of free space? You can say 0. And then if I say, what's the electric susceptibility of water? You can give me a number. And that gives us a very clear like, physical connection between the number that we're using and the, the amount of responsiveness of the medium. Free space, there's nothing there. It can't polarize. Therefore, its electric susceptibility is 0. Water has a whole bunch of oxygen, hydrogen uh, covalent bonds <coughs> that are not symmetric. Therefore, it's a dipole, and it can respond. <coughs> this electrical permittivity, oh wait, sorry, I have an error here. Do, 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 do. When we write this in terms of this electric susceptibility, we have to have this epsilon naught, which is the permittivity of free space. Otherwise, my units get all messed up. So if I write it in this final form, this basically says, all right, the displacement, the thing that describes what the effect of a charge is, is actually linearly related to the electric field, which tells me how the environment, in fact, acts back on the other charges in the system. And in this approximation where I've written this, if I consider this electrical permittivity to be a constant, and I write it in this form, what I'm basically saying is I'm assuming that the medium responds instantaneously fast, and that its response is linear. So if I, for example, say that the permittivity of water at room temperature is approximately equal to 80 times the permittivity of free space. The permittivity of free space is given by 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs per volt meter. <coughs> when I say that the permittivity of water is given by this value, I'm basically saying, well, if I put a charge in water, the water is going to respond and it's going to polarize. If I make the charge twice as high, it's going to polarize twice as much. That's the linear part. The fact that this is just multiplying E. And when I say it's instantaneous, there's no frequency dependence of this epsilon as I've written it right now. And that means that if I connect this to a, um, a function generator and I apply a kilohertz wave or a 10 kilohertz wave or a DC wave or a 100 kilohertz wave, this response will always be the same. And what that basically means is the characteristic time with which a water molecule rotates has to be fast as compared to the perturbation I'm applying to the system. And it takes about 10 picoseconds for a water molecule to flip. So until we get pretty close to 10 to the 11 hertz, the, assuming that this is frequency independent is good. And until we get to electric fields on the order of, let's say, 10 to the 10th, we find that twice as much charge leads to twice as much uh, polarization. So this linear instantaneous model is really quite good for water. We will talk about some cases where it starts to break down. But this is the basic story. Now the reason why I went through this, I'll argue that this description is longer than most people would spend on this. The reason I say this is, first of all, because a lot of people are not comfortable with what electric displacement means. And in fact, people often don't use it. What everyone ends up using is the electric field. And the reason why it's convenient to get rid of D and use the electric field is because, well, these two things are proportional to each other. But physically, they mean very different things. If I want to know what I do to a charge, electric field is the proper term. If I want to know what a charge does to its environment, electric displacement is, is the right way to think about it. Now, for convenience, because of this very simple relation, we'll end up writing everything in terms of the electric field. But I want you to keep in mind that this electric field is only telling part of the story. In fact, because the permittivity of water is equal to 80 times the permittivity of free space, that means that when I take a charge and I put it into water, from this number I can gauge how much of the response is electric field and how much of the response is polarization. 
Like, what's the primary thing that happens in water when I put a charge in? Am I primarily inducing an electric field, or am I primarily inducing a polarization? Right, I'm, I'm primarily creating a polarization. The fact that this is 80 means that 79 80ths of what happens when I put a charge into water is that the water molecules flip. They basically cancel out 79 80ths of what the electric field would have been if this had been free space. The electric field that I induce is in fact only the small residual thing that's left over after all of the water polarization happens. So again, we'll talk about things in terms of electric field, but we can't forget that the primary thing that happens when I put charges in water is that the water orients itself. And in fact, we'll see this theme as we go through the term. On a molecular level, we'll see that when we create charge, it primarily leads to a polarization of the water, and then there's a little bit of electric field left. When we apply an electric field to a nanoparticle, we'll find that the primary thing that happens is the ion cloud, ion cloud around it will reorient itself. And then there's a small residual thing that's left over that makes the nanoparticles move around or attract each other. And on and on. Okay, well, this is what we write for a point charge. We have a point charge relation for displacement and a point charge relation for force. But if we want to put this into a governing equation, really we, we, really, we really want differential descriptions of this. And from these expressions, we can come up with two key expressions. One is Gauss's law for electricity. which says that the divergence of the electric displacement is equal to the charge density. So I'm using rho sub e to denote the net charge density. By net charge density, I mean if I have equal number of positive and negative charges in an infinitesimal control volume, my net charge density is zero. If I have more positive charge, then rho e is positive. More negative charge, then rho e is negative. The second relation that's important is the volumetric force on a charged fluid. And this is simply that the volumetric force, which I'm writing as a lowercase f, is given by rho sub e times the electric field. And you can see that this is related to that. It's just a volumetric de description. This is now a vector description that falls specifically out of the spatial form of this electric displacement. Because you have this electric displacement that is radially symmetric and decaying with delta r squared, you can show that the, the divergence of these fluxes are, uh, <coughs> is proportional to this rho sub e. All right, these are the two things we need to do to take the Navier-Stokes equations and put them in a form such that we can now start applying electrokinetic forces. First of all, this volumetric force, this is just a body force term that we're going to put on the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations. So just like you would put rho g in a case where buoyancy is important, we'll put rho e times the vector e. This expression is the expression that we're going to be able to use to take this charge density and relate it back to electrical potential. And the reason why we do this is because the boundary conditions that we can apply to our flows typically don't involve specification of where the net charge density is somewhere. Instead, what these boundary conditions can specify is what is the voltage on some boundary. 